Hi all, welcome back to Emergency Medicine Lecture Series. I have been doing videos in the past. This is a long time gap. I was actually busy with preparing a textbook for emergency medical technicians, which I have completed successfully and given to the publisher for publication, and it will be in the market soon. Thank you for all your cooperation. In today's video, we are going to learn about how to deal with an adult patient presenting with fever as major complaint to emergency department. And Dr. S. Prakash Babu, Associate Professor and in charge HOD, Department of Emergency Medicine, St. Peter's Medical College Hospital and Research Institute. Coming to the epidemiology of fever, this is one of the major presenting complaints in the ED. In fact, this fever scores number one as complaining feature in patients presenting to ED. Morbidity and mortality due to fever increases exponentially with age. Suppose an young adult has developed a fever or a serious infection, the mortality rate is as less than 1%. The same in a patient who is greater than 65 years old, hospitalization rate reaches nearly 70 to 90% and mortality is 9%. There are multiple contributing factors for this. We'll learn as we go through the lecture. Infection is the most common cause for fever. And most infections are bacterial in nature. In the body region, respiratory tract, urinary tract, skin and soft tissue infections together account for 80% of these infections. Rest of the areas together will include 20% of these infections. You should learn something about pathophysiology of fever. You all know that temperature is controlled by three optic nucleus of the hypothalamus, which is the thermostat regulator. It maintains temperature between 36 degree to 37 degree centigrade or 96.8 to 100 degree Fahrenheit. Whenever there is an insult and an exogenous infection, these infection organisms like viruses and bacterial antigens produce pyrogens exogenous pyrogens these pyrogens lead to activation of immune cells like neutrophils macrophages and dendritic cells these immune cells will synthesize and release pro-inflammatory mediators like tnf alpha interleukin 1 interleukin 6 interleukin 8 and interferon beta or gamma these pro-inflammatory mediators enters the cns via blood brain barrier and the vascular fenestrations in the brain. In response to these pro inflammatory mediators, CNS will synthesize prostaglandin E2, and this prostaglandin E2 stimulates cyclic AMP pathway, which resets the thermoregulatory set point. The thermoregulatory set point is the one which manages the body temperature. When the thermoregulatory set point is set to a higher level, more than 100 degree Fahrenheit, the body temperature conserving mechanisms and heat producing mechanisms will get activated. That results in increased body temperature, which we call as fever. Fever is maintained as long as endogenous pyrogens and PGE2 are high in the blood circulation. Cyclogenous inhibitors like paracetamol decrease fever by reducing the synthesis of prostaglandins. Age, malnutrition, immunosuppression, and chronic diseases may blend the febrile response, and patient will not show any febrile response until the disease has progressed to an irreversible stage. So these patients are vulnerable patients who have high morbidity and mortality due to any infection. Moderate elevations in body temperature serve to aid host defenses because they increase the chemotaxis, that is, they increase the neutrophils to phagocytos more and more antigens. They also decrease the microbial replication, increase the temperature, improves lymphocyte function. So there will be a combined attack on the invading organisms to eliminate those organisms or reduce their replication as a counteracting mechanism. So in this sense, increased body temperature is beneficial to the organism. Not only beneficial effects, there are adverse effects of fever. 
because of increased temperature all the processes are metabolic functions are increased so there is increased oxygen consumption metabolic demands for nutrients like glucose are very high there is protein breakdown to meet the high, higher demands of glucose and there is gluconeogenesis which can alter the glucose metabolism also the mismatch between thermostatic set point and the body temperature is the cause for chills when there is a mismatch body presents with chills and the patient can have rigors when there is shivering thermogenesis shivering repeated muscle contractions and relaxations will present as rigors when the thermostatic set point is reduced to normal the patient suddenly feels hot and he sweats profusely until body temperature falls to the reduced thermostatic set point coming to the differential diagnosis of fevers as i told most commonly it's the infectious causes if you take system wise respiratory system is the either upper respiratory system or the lower respiratory tract are the most common sites for infections critical causes in the respiratory system include bacterial pneumonia usually presents with respiratory failure emergent causes include simple bacterial pneumonia a peritonsillar abscess retropharyngeal abscess epiglottitis non emergent causes are upper respiratory tract infections like otitis media sinusitis pharyngitis bronchitis influenza and tuberculosis which is a chronic disease cardiovascular manifestations include endocarditis and pericarditis gastrointestinal peritonitis is the critical one and there can be appendicitis cholecystitis diverticulitis which are emergent causes colitis or enteritis which doesn't actually lead to death of a patient by itself a colitis and enteritis the genital urinary tract pyelonephritis tubo ovarian abscess public inflammatory disease fall in emergent causes cystitis epididymis protostatitis or non emergent causes the neurologic system meningitis cavernous sinus thrombosis or other venous sinus thrombosis fall in critical categories encephalitis brain abscess or the emergent causes coming to skin and soft tissue infection cellulitis infected decubitus ulcer soft tissue abscess or the emergent causes systemic sepsis or septic shock along with meningococcemia are the critical causes and there are some non infectious causes any inflammatory reaction in the body any insult to any organ can present as fever especially acute myocardial infarction pulmonary embolism or infarction intracranial hemorrhage cerebrovascular accident neuroleptic malignant syndrome thyroid storm acute adrenal insufficiency transfusion reaction pulmonary edema all are critical ccf dehydration recent seizures sickle cell disease transplant rejection pancreatitis dvt are the emergent causes non emergent causes include drug fever mainly antibiotic fever malignancies all your connective tissue diseases can present with fever so how are you going to approach a patient who is critically ill remember in any critically ill patients it's not the diagnosis which are going to concentrate it's rapid stabilization of the patient rapid assessment and stabilization of the patient so first you take an abbreviated history and perform a focused physical examination without wasting much time decide whether the patient is stable or unstable the features of unstability include either q sofa falls to in the emergency department if you have score q sofa or altered mental status respiratory distress with respiratory rate more than 30 and hemodynamic instability with increased pulse rate and lowered blood pressure your first step even before diagnosing or trying to do anything is a rapid resuscitation as appropriate manage the airway if needed supplement oxygen put the patient on a multiple cardiac monitor and give iv fluids if iv fluids are not improving the vitals then consider going for vasopressors temperature management is very very important because it can give comfort to the patient consider rapid cooling broad spectrum antibiotics antivirals and antifungals take a complete history along with physical examination once the patient is stabilized how do you approach a stable patient with fever first you take a complete history and do a full head to toe examination if needed consider ivf for rehydration 
antipyretics to reduce temperature, antiemetics if the patient is having actual vomiting, and analgesics if the patient is having pain and any region. If there are any positive findings or localizing features, which we will learn later, order appropriate and specific diagnostic testing as needed, and treat fever. If there are no positive findings, the most common investigations that will give you a clue about the focus of infection are urinalysis, CBC, and chest x ray. If there are positive results in these, you consider specific management. If there are no positive results, you reassess the clinical status. The clinical status is improving. You go for a watchful waiting. Symptomatic treatment is appropriate. The clinical status is unchanged. That means your support to treatment is not working. So you need to assign to most likely diagnostic category. Then follow the diagnostic. Whether it fits into miscellaneous, malignancy, any malignancy is suspected, any autoimmune diseases are suspected, or any infectious causes are suspected. If the condition is worsening or condition is unchanged, you can consider additional diagnostic testing like lumbar puncture, CT abdomen, or pelvis, PPD, blood culture, and urine culture. Empirical treatment with broad spectrum antibiotics and antibiotics, antivirals, and antifungals is appropriate. Coming to some of the most important historical points that will yield you most commonly a diagnosis or pinpoint the source of infection. Collect about onset of the fever and its duration and magnitude. How severe is the temperature? Mild fever, moderate fever, high fever, any associated symptoms, the timing of fever and its patterns, either it is quaternal, tertiary, uh, like in malaria, the step ladder pattern as in malignancies. Intermittent or continuous fever, any recent or remote travel which gives a clue about any tropical infections. Similarly, you can ask about any encroachment into areas of mosquito ridden areas where the patient can come into contact with mosquitoes and the must vector borne illness. Collect history about any chronic illnesses, any past surgeries, hospitalizations, and treatment modalities which can give you a clue about the source of infection presence of any prosthetic hot walls or any indwelling de device should be carefully noted because that might be the focus of infection history of any skin infections in close family members or close contacts which can transmit by contact medications including any antipyretics patient might be afebrile when he presented to you in the emergency department but he might have taken antipyretics which is the cause for afebrile now so you need to take history about taking any antipyretics, change in mental status, difficulty in ambulating or some other functional decline will give you how serious is the illness. Patients with pneumonia may inconsistently demonstrate productive cough or shortness of breath. So any adult patient over 60 years of age consider pneumonia as differential diagnosis even if the patient is not giving a history of productive cough or shortness of breath. Non-specific symptoms include anorexia, weight loss, weakness, lethargy, nausea and recurrent falls. History of cancer or radiation therapy like leukopenia, immunosuppressive therapy can give you a clue to your source of infection. As I told earlier, the systemic localizing features, features which localize the source of infection to a particular system, dysuria frequency and plant pain points towards urinary tract infection, chest pain, cough with sputum towards lower respiratory tract infection, cough, sneezing, running nose, nasal blockade, and headache points to upper respiratory tract infection, especially sinusitis. Abdominal pain, distension, constipation, diarrhea, and vomiting point to GAT. Subcutaneous swelling, first discharge, and pain. Subcutaneous or subcutaneous swelling. Headache, altered sensory increases point towards CMS. Powerful findings and examination. The presence and magnitude of fever is the most important. The older, very young, or chronically ill patients may not mount a febrile response to significant infection. So never underestimate fever in older patients or very young patients. Temperatures may fluctuate during the day or over the course of days. So rechecks should always be done. Most accurate method to measure core temperature is the pulmonary artery transistor, which is a cumbersome procedure and not needed most of the times. Bladder thermistors are the most practical and accurate measurements for core temperature. But again, this is an invasive procedure. You may not want to 
go for an invasive procedure in each and every patient. Rectal temperatures are the most commonly checked. They typically 0.7 to 1 degree centigrade higher than oral temperatures. Oral and axillary temperatures can also be checked, but you need to add at least 1 degree centigrade per the value what you got in the thermometer. Fever is inconsistent associated with tachycardia and tachypnea. This is the most common reaction when temperature rises. Heart rate usually increases by 10 beats per minute for each 1 degree Fahrenheit raise in temperature. Some of the cases there is relative bradycardia, especially patients who are in beta blockers, drug related fevers, enteric fever, brucellosis, and leptospirosis will have relative bradycardia. Frank bradycardia occurs in rheumatic fever because of direct involvement of the myocardium, Lyme disease, viral myocarditis, and endocarditis. Respiratory rate may increase 2 to 4 breaths per minute per degree centigrade. Acidosis, shock, add respiratory infections can accentuate the kidney. Examination is directed usually by localizing symptoms. Head and neck examinations directed finding treatable cause for fever, impending airway compromise. Examine the neck for lymphadenitis or thyromegaly. Look for nuchal rigidity. The lungs are examined for rails, pleural rubs, dullness, and percussion. The heart is examined for pericardial rub or development of new murmurs. Abdominal examination for tenderness, guarding, and rigidity will give you a clue about peritonitis. Rectal examination is the most commonly missed but can be easily performed and should be performed in each and every patient without which your examination is not complete. Look for tone, contents, any tenderness or any palpable masses or abscess. Examine the external genitalia, look for any abscess, discharges or any swellings. Do a pelvic examination in a woman, look for discharge, any adnexal tenderness which can point to pelvic inflammatory disease. Skin and extremities should be evaluated for any rash, petechiae, giant inflammation or evidence of soft tissue infection. Do not forget buttocks back for evidence of infection or abscess. Examine spine for any swelling or deformed or tenderness which can point to quartz spine. So by now you would have narrowed down your differential diagnosis to particular things. So by doing some ancillary testing you would like to confirm the clinical diagnosis. Two most useful tests where you cannot find any localizing features are urinalysis and chest radiography because 80% of infections are occurring in either urinary tract or the respiratory tract. ESR is usually done but it is non-specific and there are irregular alterations in ESR so you cannot depend on erythrocyte experimentation rate. Gram sharing of appropriate samples is helpful. It gives a clue to what antibiotic you need to use. Cultures does not alter emergency evaluation and treatment because usually cultures take at least 48 to 72 hours for the results to come back by which time you would have shifted the patient. But before giving any antibiotic, you need to collect samples for cultures which will aid the intensivist or the general physician to narrow down the antibiotic management. CSF analysis can be considered in patients with altered sensorium where you are suspecting any meningitis or meningoencephalitis. ABG is in critically ill patients helps by giving you the degree of illness the patient is undergoing or the degree of oxygen demand that the patient is needing. Abdominal CT in patients with suspected intra-abdominal pathology will pinpoint to the diagnosis and aids in planning an operative procedure. CT brain is indicated before lumbar puncture in meningitis to rule out any raised intracranial angle pressure along with checking for fatty lighting. Coming to the empirical management, increased temperature can lead to exhaustion and dehydration. Although routine use of antipyretics is not required and not indicated, but there is no harm in using the antipyretics. Moreover, reducing the temperature can make the patient feel better. Temperatures greater than 41 degrees centigrade can cause neuronal damage, so they should be promptly attended by antipyretics and also external cooling measures. Both oral and intravenous estomenopin have similar efficacy. The patient doesn't have vomitings are able to take orally, oral estomenopin can be given, but intravenous estomenopin acts faster. If you want to reduce the temperature at a faster rate, you can go for intravenous estomenopin. Patients with seriously require intravenous fluids and empirical antibiotics. Empirical antibiotics should be 
selected based on the most common source of infection and local susceptibility patterns. You can take the help of your microbiologist or your clinical pharmacologist to know the local susceptibility patterns and choosing a broad spectrum antibiotic. <clears throat> Patient with respiratory failure or refractory shock will need mechanical ventilator support. In acute febrile immunocompromised patients, antivirals and antifungals are also indicated. Coming to the final part, disposition of the patient. Here we are going to learn which patients can be treated and out, outpatient patient, which patients need hospital admission, and the patients who need intensive care admission. Localized infections in young adults without any coma optis, and there are no signs of SERS. You can treat the patient in an outpatient basis. Indications for hospitalization include older patients, especially with coma optis, even before SERS has set in. Patients with no source identified in the initial examination and initial testing. Patients with suspected MRSA infections, especially cutaneous infections. Indications for ICU infections include patients presenting with shock, those requiring mechanical ventilation, and patients with multiple comorbidities. Thank you.